Hey there, I just wanted to take a minute and welcome you to Geneseo Evangelical Free Church. We are so thankful that this resource was made available to you and that it will bless you in your walk with the Lord. We also pray that this resource would be used in conjunction with you belonging to a local church body. And if that means you need to make a trip to visit us, we would love that opportunity. If you haven't made a connection with us in person, we would love to take a few minutes and get to know you a little bit better and also learn how we can best serve you with the ministries we have at Geneseo e If you're looking for more resources that are available to you or you want more information about our church and our ministries, you can visit GEFC. Dot org. That's G-E-F-C dot org. And you can contact us at any time that you need. But at this time, we pray that this message would bless you. Well, please be seated. I'm Pastor Steve, and I'm so glad to be able to go and spend this Lord's morning with you. Today, we're going to start a new series. It's entitled The Facets of David. And the name of the series was actually inspired by something that perhaps a significant number of you ladies have on your hand right now, a cut diamond. The diamond has a number of interesting characteristics. One of the things about diamonds is that they're incredibly hard. There's a scale that is used to determine the hardness of things. It's called the Mohs scale. For example, a steel nail is 6.5. A masonry bit that you would use to drill through concrete, 8.5. The diamond has a hardness of 10 out of 10. That's part of why it's so valuable, but also so useful as a gemstone, because it can cut glass, and you're not likely to chip it. But the most obvious feature of the diamond, the reason why many of us have them on rings, is because of its beauty. The brilliant cut diamond, the most common cut of a diamond, has 58 individual facets. There are some diamonds with as many as 120 facets. It's the combination of the way that light is reflected and refracted through those strategic cut facets that accounts for the diamond's place as one of the most coveted of gems. I decided to do a series on the life of King David because of the fact that like a diamond, David is so incredibly multifaceted. Listen to this description of him by Richard D. Phillips. A modern assessment of David's character and career sees him as a giant slayer, shepherd, musician, manipulator of men, outlaw, disguised madman, loyal friend and subject, lover, warrior, dancer, and merrymaker, father, brother, son, master, servant, religious enthusiast, and king and then asks, what are we to make of this enormous portrait? Where do we begin? Well, I think the answer to that is we begin at the beginning. In 1 Samuel chapter 16, and if you're a Marvel hero, I'm gonna call this David's origin story. And over the course of the next couple of months, we're going to explore these different facets of David. And in the process, I think we'll see that he is as complex and multifaceted as we are, because we're pretty complicated too. We're going to find some aspect of David that I think all of us can relate to. Also in this series of 13 planned messages, every sermon is going to begin with a statement about everyone or nobody. I'll give you just a little smattering. Everyone needs a challenge. Nobody needs a lunatic. Everyone needs a promise. Nobody needs a mistress. Amen? You get the idea, so let's jump in. This week's message is entitled, Everyone Needs an Opportunity. 19th century British Prime Minister Benjamin Disraeli once said, One secret of success in life is for a man to be ready for his opportunity when it comes. You know, our lives are filled with opportunities. Big ones, small ones, some that are caught, some that we miss. And when those opportunities are missed, some of them are tragically gone forever. As we study King David, we're going to see that opportunity was thrust upon David very suddenly, but he didn't squander that opportunity when it came. He seized it. Our origin story, though, doesn't begin with David. 
In fact, he is not going to be named until verse 13 of our text. We begin with the interlaced story of Samuel and Saul, and the first opportunity that we're going to discuss is the opportunity to be redirected. Turn with me to 1 Samuel chapter 16, verses 1 through 5. The Lord said to Samuel, How long will you grieve over Saul since I have rejected him from being king over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and go, and I will send you to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided for myself a king among his sons. And Samuel said, How can I go? If Saul hears it, he will kill me. And the Lord said, Take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. And invite Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show you what you shall do. And you shall anoint for me him whom I declare to you. Samuel did what the Lord commanded, and he came to Bethlehem. And the elders of the city came to meet him trembling and said, Do you come peaceably? And he said, Peaceably, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Consecrate yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. And he consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. Now, there's some important background information here. You, rem you may remember that King Saul was never God's choice. He was the people's choice. Israel rejected God as king so that they could look like the other nations of the world. And in the sermon two weeks ago on resurrected parenting, we discussed that the people of Israel were also motivated by the fact that although Samuel was a great leader, he was not an effective father. And his sons were unworthy men. They were lovers of bribe who perverted justice. And therefore the people rejected them. Although this judgment must have hurt Samuel, he ultimately came to love Saul nonetheless. Even though Saul was the replacement that should have gone to his sons perhaps in his mind, he came to love Saul. He saw his kingly appearance, and then he observed his growth as a king. He saw the way that Saul exhibited courage, how he won many battles, how he started to bring this nation of 12 separate tribes together into a single functioning nation. However, on two occasions, Saul disobeyed God's explicit commands. And after the second such thing, God rejected Saul as king. And Saul is told by God that he will not have a dynasty, that there will not be a succession of kings of his family, that his would be a dynasty of one and his royal line would end. Our text begins with a question, but it also raises a question. God asked Samuel, how long will you grieve over Saul since I have rejected him from being king over Israel? And it's interesting that the text of the Hebrew word here is continuative. That continuative tense suggests that Samuel has been mourning this moment where God rejected Saul as king for an extended period of time. But there's the question within the question, how long? How long has Samuel been frozen in mourning? And we don't have in scripture a fully descriptive timeline that fills in all the gaps enabling us to answer this question. However, I found a Bible student who took the time to map out the entire life of King Saul, to look at the entirety of his reign in order to come up with some parameters. And if you look at the length of his reign and you carve out time for all the various military victories that took place, it seems likely that Saul was rejected by God at least three and possibly as many as 10 years before Samuel was commanded to anoint David. God had reject, rejected him, but he continued in office for somewhere between three to 10 years. Now that's a long time to be stuck. Even if we take that shorter time frame of three years, that is a tremendously long time for Samuel to be stuck. And God has been patient with Samuel. But we also see that he's coming to a point where he's reaching a limit with Samuel's inaction. So he finally steps up and he commands him to go to the family of Jesse the Bethlehemite and anoint one of his sons as king. 
But notice the specific language here. I will send you to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided for myself a king among his sons. I think it's mission critical that we observe that whereas Israel chose Saul, that God is now making his own choice. He has provided for himself a king. And Samuel is then sent out with incomplete information. He's told that he is to anoint one of Jesse's sons, but he's not told which one he will have to trust God to lead him in this. And it's in the opening words of verse 2 that we learn the reason for Samuel's inaction, fear. And Samuel said, how can I go? If Saul hears it, he will kill me. Now, you may remember how Saul began his journey towards kingship. If you've read the story, Saul's origin story, he was hiding in a big pile of coats while they were busy trying to go and make him king. One of his defining characteristics, however, was paranoia. And there's an old joke. Just because you're paranoid doesn't mean they're not out to get you. Now, Samuel was not just any judge of Israel. He was the kingmaker. Remember, it was Samuel who anointed Saul, and in that process, Saul was made king. Samuel is the kingmaker. And if Samuel went significantly outside of his home turf of Ramah, Saul could grow suspicious. And Samuel knew Saul, and he knew that this would arouse his suspicion. But there's also something very unique about Samuel that is not true of the other judges of Israel. He was not just any judge. He was a Levitical judge. He was of the priestly lineage. He was one who could offer sacrifices. And God is going to provide Samuel cover by telling him to bring a sacrificial animal with him. Samuel obeys God's command. And in verse 4, we see that Saul's paranoia has actually become epidemic in Israel. Observe the way that Samuel is greeted. In verse 4, the elders of the city came to meet him trembling and said, Do you come peaceably? And he said, Peaceably I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. And I think there is a lesson here for all of us, that tense people make people tense. I think we all know this. For example, if you have a difficult boss, a boss who is wired tight, have you noticed the way that everyone gets set on edge? For almost three years after my church had merged with another church, I became a staff pastor for the first time. And I worked under a tense lead pastor. And I watched how a group of amiable and easygoing pastoral colleagues began to lose their confidence, second-guess themselves. They lost their sense of peace and well-being because tense people make people tense. And when a king is tense, the entire nation can take on a certain pathology. And that is what we begin to see in Israel. The nation is becoming as tense as their leader. Now, does God tell Samuel to lie? Is is this heifer just a ruse? Now, it did provide Samuel with cover. As a Levitical judge, Samuel was authorized to sacrifice a heifer in providing for atonement in an unsolved murder in a rural district. I know that's really weird, really specific, but it's right there in the law of Moses. So that meant that in his going to this place, Bethlehem, with a sacrificial animal, he would not arouse suspicion. However, the sacrifice was also an important part of consecrating those who would participate in the anointing of Israel's future king, a very holy and solemn event. So this is not just a ruse, this is an essential thing. Jesse and the elders of Bethlehem must be spiritually prepared for entering into the presence of their God in so momentous a moment. You know, as I looked at these opening five verses, I was struck by the fact that at some time in our lives, everyone needs an opportunity to be redirected. And that's because we are like sheep, the sheep that we were singing about this morning, the sheep that David tended. 
We are wanderers who wander from God. Samuel got stuck in fear. He needed new marching orders, and God applied just the right amount of pressure. And I find great comfort in this. Anointing David king will be the crowning achievement of Saul's life. This is the big moment in his ministry. God wasn't about to let him miss it. So let me ask you the question. Are you stuck? Are you frozen in fear? Or are you distracted by life's many diversions and entertainments? We are living in the age of distraction. And we can get stuck in so many different ways. But there is great news. God can get you unstuck. He wants to redirect you. He wants to get you back in the action. But there is often a critical step that you must take. You need to allow God. You need to welcome God and allow him to redirect you into your true destiny. And if you prayerfully seek him, and if you're open to this, God will do it. He will get you back on track. Now, the second opportunity that we want to discuss is an opportunity to be noticed. We're going to look at verses 6 through 13. But I want to begin with a smaller chunk, verses 6 through 10 of 1 Samuel 16. Turn with me. When they came, he looked on Eliab and thought, Surely the Lord's anointed is before him. And the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. For the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. Then Jesse called Abinadab and made him pass before Samuel. And he said, neither has the Lord chosen this one. Then Jesse made Shammah pass by and he said, neither has the Lord chosen this one. And Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel. And Samuel said to Jesse, the Lord has not chosen these. Well, let's pause for a moment and reflect on who Jesse is. Jesse's father is a bit of an obscure name to us. His name was Obed. In the Hebrew, his name means servant. However, Jesse's grandparents are well known to us, Ruth and Boaz. If you've ever read the book of Ruth, it's the story of this incredible couple. So we see that Jesse comes from a great lineage. His grandmother was the epitome of loyalty. You remember in the story of Ruth, how her mother-in-law Naomi had lost her husband, lost her two sons. She was just left with her two daughter-in-laws, no blood relation to her. She felt stricken. She even said, call me Mara, for my life has become bitter. And she told her two daughter-in-laws to go away, to go home, go back to Moab, go back to your families. And one of them, Orpah, did so, but the other one, Ruth, said, no, your God, my God, your people, my people she refused to leave ruth was incredibly loyal and we also read about boaz a man of tremendous generosity he knew of what had happened in the family of naomi so he instructed the men working his vineyards to um, not vineyards his fields to go and take out sheaves of grain and dump it make it easy for ruth to be bring in a great deal of grain in a barley harvest he was incredibly generous. So that's the, the backstory for Jesse. That's his family. He has a great legacy. And the question is, will he represent that fine legacy in his own generation? We're going to put a comma in that question. And let's reflect on where Jesse is. He's in Bethlehem. Now we have a pretty strong mental image of Bethlehem, right? We think about it every Christmas. We sing songs about the little town of Bethlehem. And if you're picturing in your mind gentle rolling hills and pastoral vistas, you're wrong. Bethlehem was nothing like this. One commentator described the Bethlehem region in this way. The country around is hilly but hardly beautiful. The limestone rock gives a bare appearance to the hills which is not redeemed by boldness of form or picturesqueness of outline. Bethlehem was not a pretty place. 
It was primarily an area for growing grain, but it was not easy to grow grain there because the farms were tiny. They were built into the crags in the hills. To give you an idea of just how elevated this land was, it is 3,000 feet above the Jordan River. It is 3,000 above the Mediterranean Sea, 4,000 feet above the Jordan River. So this is a tremendously steep area with all of these little crags and tiny little farms built into them. And it is in this bleak area that we we'll find Jesse and his eight boys. He has eight sons, but only seven have been paraded before Samuel. And the key to this omission is the fact that Samuel, Jesse, and all Israel seem to share a key blind spot. And the Hebrew text is interesting, and it's really hard to translate. Man looks to the eyes, God looks to the heart. The wording sounds odd to us, but the meaning is plain, that we are drawn towards external things. We have preferences. We prefer tall. We prefer fit. We prefer symmetrical or balanced faces. We prefer youthful maturity, old enough to have some experience, young enough to have some vitality. And when it comes to kings and queens, we look for somebody who has regal bearing, someone who looks like a king. Now Eliab, the oldest of Jesse, was Samuel's first choice because he just looked like a king. He looked like Saul. Imagine how shocked he was. Imagine how shocked Samuel was when God rejected Eliab. And then God went on to reject the next, and then the next, and the remainder of the seven sons. Do you know, I thought about it. I imagine that God was shocked at Samuel. I think God was shocked that Samuel did not understand better. Because Saul was tall, Saul looked like a king, Saul was regal, and he proved to be a grave disappointment, and he broke the heart of God. You would think that Samuel would have learned something from the lesson of Saul, but he had that same blind spot that we do, and he just saw with his eyes. Eliab would have been a bad sequel, and later his bad character will emerge, and we'll see that in some of his later interactions with David. Commentator W.G. Blakey makes an incisive comment. The world is full of idolatries, but I question if any idolatry has been more extensively practiced than the idolatry of outward appearance. But let's continue as we come to Jesse's overlooked son in verses 11 through 13. Then Samuel said to Jesse, are all your sons here? And he said, there remains yet the youngest, but behold, he is keeping the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, send and get him, for we will not sit down until he comes here. And he sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy and had beautiful eyes and was handsome. And the Lord said, arise, anoint him, for this is he. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And the spirit of the Lord rushed upon David from that day forward. And Samuel rose up and went to Ramah. Now, these few verses complete our portrait of Jesse. We learn in them, although it's not, it doesn't jump out of the page at us, that Jesse was not a wealthy man. Because a rich man in that day would have had servants to watch over his flocks, not a son. Now, this is by no means a blight on his character. It simply provides us some important context concerning David's family of origin, that he grew up in a family that did not have a lot and was a family that knew some struggle. What does reflect badly on Jesse is his treatment of David. Now, one of my favorite rock songs was from the 70s rock group America. You remember the song, Horse With No Name? Well, notice something about David. David is the son with no name. Jesse refers to him in the Hebrew text as Katan. It can mean young in age, but it can also mean small in stature. In many ways, it was the perfect descriptive for David. But do you see how David is nameless? He's the nameless little one, unsummoned and seemingly forgotten. 
Jesse seems to lack the loyal and generous qualities of his grandparents. In so many ways, he seems nothing like them. It seems as if Samuel had to turn the screws in on Jesse a bit. Look at verse 11. Send and get him, for we will not sit down until he comes here. Under the threat of no supper, Jesse fetches his little one. And as soon as he enters the room, God instructs Samuel to anoint him. God has chosen a king for Israel, and it is not until verse 13 that the runt of the litter is finally named. And the spirit of the Lord rushed upon David from that day forward, and Samuel rose up and went to Ramah. But let me ask you an important question. Have you ever felt invisible? The worst form of this is invisible in a crowd or invisible in your own family. Maybe you were the middle child, the one that the psychologists love to call the lost child. Or maybe you were the good kid who became invisible while mom and dad were always focused on the drama queen or the bad boy siblings. And you just wish that somebody would notice you. You see, there's a basic human hunger that we all have. We all have this desire to be noticed. One of the most important lessons in David's origin story is that God noticed him. He may have been young, he may have been small, but God saw a giant slayer in this boy of about 10 to 15 years of age. And if you feel in any way like David and Jesse's sheepfold, I want you to remember something. God has numbered the hairs of your head. God has said that his eye is on the sparrow, that not one of them falls without our heavenly father taking notice of them, and yet God loves us more than the birds of the air. I want you to know and believe in your heart that God notices you. This powerful moment of David's filling sets up our final opportunity. An opportunity to be filled. Look at verses 14 through 23. But I'm going to add the second part of verse 13 so that we can make an important contrast. And the spirit of the Lord rushed upon David from that day forward. But the spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, and a harmful spirit from the Lord tormented him. And Saul's servants said to him, Behold now, a harmful spirit from God is tormenting you. Let our Lord now command your servants who are before you to seek out a man who is skillful in playing the lyre. And when the harmful spirit from God is upon you, he will play it and you will be well. So Saul said to his servants, provide for me a man who can play well and bring him to me. One of the young men answered, behold, I have seen a son of Jesse the Bethlehemite, who is skillful in playing, a man of valor, a man of war, prudent in speech a man of good presence, and the Lord is with him. Therefore Saul sent messengers to Jesse and said, Send me David your son who is with the sheep. And Jesse took a donkey laden with bread and a skin of wine and a young goat and sent them by David his son to Saul. And David came to Saul and entered his service. And Saul loved him greatly, and he became his armor bearer. And Saul sent to Jesse, saying, Let David remain in my service, for he has found favor in my sight. And whenever the harmful spirit from God was upon Saul, David took the lyre and played it with his hand. So Saul was refreshed and was well, and the harmful spirit departed from him. Now, I would love to explore with you this entire set of verses more closely. There is so much here. But I want to make a simple contrast, and I want to drag out one elephant in the room. The contrast is between the filling of David and the emptying of Saul. You see, the anointing of a king in these days was more than symbolic. Yesterday, we observed something that we have not seen in England for 70 years, the coronation of a sovereign, continuing a tradition of a 1,000 years. And the coronation, if you watched it, was filled with symbolism, a crowning, the giving of a new scepter, Remember when Queen Elizabeth II died? They broke the scepter to indicate that her life was ended. So there was the crown, the giving of the new scepter, and many other solemn rites and traditions. But the anointing of Israel's kings was actually much more than symbolic. When Saul was anointed, we're told that the Spirit of God came upon him. 
That is why this young man who was hiding in a pile of coats on his coronation day becomes this mighty warrior who unites a nation because God's spirit was with him. But he was more filled with the spirit in the manner that some of the judges were, like Samson. It was not a forever thing. It was temporary. And although God had already rejected Saul, he had not removed that spiritual presence from him until this moment. You see, only one Israelite would be anointed king. Only one would be imbued and empowered by God's spirit in this unique and special way. So David was filled and Saul was empty. But it was worse than that. Look at verse 14 again. But the spirit of the Lord departed from Saul and a harmful spirit from the Lord tormented him. So here's the big question. Here's the elephant in the room. Was God passive in this or active? Did God withdraw his protective spirit from Saul and Saul then became vulnerable to all of his natural ill tempers or alternatively did God send a demonic spirit to torture Saul clearly you and I are going to be more comfortable with the former but the more active understanding is the more natural reading of this difficult verse and the more I thought about it I came to the conclusion that the truth is somewhere between these two you see, I believe that God withdrew his spirit, and then Saul does become spiritually vulnerable. Not only vulnerable to his own ill tempers, but vulnerable to spiritual attack. God permitted a demonic spirit to afflict him. Because everything that happens in our lives is filtered through God's fingers. He either allows or he does not allow, and he allowed this to happen to Saul. And that's why this spirit is said to be from the Lord. But notice that David's filling is nothing like Saul's. We saw in verse 13 that the spirit of the Lord came upon David from this day forward. You see, David received a filling that would not be taken back, despite David's many sins. We remember how Samson would be empowered when the spirit of the Lord came upon him. But when he broke his vow and his hair was cut. He lost all of his power. He lost the filling. But you see, David was giving a filling that would not diminish despite even his bad behavior. And Jesus, David's greater son, our messianic king, extends the same kind of a filling to us. As Christians, we receive a filling of the Holy Spirit. I believe this happens at the moment of our conversion, the moment that we welcome Christ into our hearts. We are filled with the Holy Spirit, but it is not a temporary filling. It doesn't come and go. In Romans eleven twenty nine, 29, the Apostle Paul teaches us that the gift and the calling of God are irrevocable. Even though we sin again and again, and as we study David, we're going to see that he sinned again and again, Yet God's Spirit abided with him, and God's Spirit abides with us. Now our text closes with a real twist of irony. This tortured soul, Saul, needs something that could be provided when a young man would skillfully play his lyre. It's kind of like a guitar-like instrument. And that young man who was sought out ultimately proves to be David, the one who is now spirit-filled, and the very one who is destined to replace him as king. You see, going back, when God rejected Saul in 1 Samuel 13, 14, we read these words. But now your kingdom shall not continue. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart, and the Lord has commanded him to be prince over his people, because you have not kept what the Lord commanded you. David ultimately comes to be called the man after God's own heart. And I'd like to close today with some powerful words by Dave Busick, applying this verse to our lives. God's choice of David shows that we don't have to quit our jobs and enter into full-time ministry to be people after God's own heart. We don't need to be famous or prominent to be people after God's own heart. We don't need to be respected or even liked by others 
to be people after God's own heart. We don't need status, influence, power, the respect or approval of men, or great responsibilities to be people after God's own heart. So what do we need? We need to be people after God's own heart. And that means we need to be people who reject the idolatry of the eyes in its many forms and see the world as God sees it, straight to the heart. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that you see us, Lord. But we also are so thankful that even though you see us with great clarity, even though you are able to see the sins that we hide from others, even though you are able to see the doubts that creep into our minds at times, despite your full knowledge of us, you see us and you extend to us the offer of salvation and the filling of your Holy Spirit. We don't deserve it, and yet you provide this grace that is greater than our sin. And Lord, if there's someone here today who has never trusted in Christ for salvation, I want to give you that opportunity right now. Pray this simple prayer with me. Dear God, I'm one of, the, one of those sheep who's wandered far from you. I've wandered into sin. I've wandered into all kinds of reckless things. And my life's become a mess. But God, I'm tired of wandering. I want to come home. I want to enter into your kingdom someday. So I ask you, Lord Jesus, to please forgive my sins, to come into my heart and to make it your home, to apply the benefit of your sacrifice to my sinful heart in order that I might be redeemed. Lord Jesus, I believe that you are everything the Bible says about you, that you are the Son of God, that you lived a life of sinless perfection, that you died a criminal's death upon a cross, that you rose victorious on the third day, and that you ascended to the right hand of your Father after appearing to many. And now you are seated beside him, ruling but also interceding on the behalf of sinners like me. Lord Jesus, I believe these things, but believing them is not enough to be saved. I need to act upon that belief, and that's what I want to do right now, to actively pursue you and invite you into my life. I pray in Jesus' name.